Well, this morning, I want to share with you along a, a, a subject uh, that is somewhat related with what I began sharing with you last week. If you were here last week, you know that I talked about God is a God of increase. And uh, we do believe that God wants to do great things and pertaining to increase in our lives. We talked about things like uh, biblical things that you and I are to increase in. We're to increase in the knowledge of God. Uh, we are to increase in, in our, our love one for another. We're to increase in the grace of God. There's a number of things uh, that God God's Word says that as individual believers, we're to increase in. And then uh, we also mention things uh, that God wants us to increase in pertaining to us as, uh, as, in, as, uh, as a congregation. He wants us, uh, I believe, to increase uh, in, in, our, in our evangelism, increase in our outreach, increase in our building people with the Word of God, a, a variety of things that we talked about. And today, I want to talk to you some more about increase, but I want to talk to you about uh, this subject uh, that is uh, pertaining to God's financial plan. And, uh, you know, I looked at my records, and I do keep fairly good records, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've been here as a church, not in this building, but we've been going as a church for 25 years, and as I examine my records, it's been about eight years since I did a series on God's financial plan or biblical principles concerning finances, and, and how many of you do know that uh, finances are a major part of our life, and if we believe and know that it is, then don't you think God might have some things to say about our finances, Right? Amen. Now, uh, there's a number of reasons why I, I hesitate sometimes to talk about finances because, uh, you know, and I'm going to mention this, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I'll mention it again. That's all right. Uh, I, I hesitate sometimes to talk about finances because people sometimes have this notion, uh, well, you know, these preachers, they're always after people's money. Well, those of you that know me know that I say very little about finances. And as I said, the last time I did a series was about eight years ago, uh, if my memory serves me and if my records on my uh, computer serve me well. And so, uh, again, this is not about getting more of your money. This is part of teaching the whole counsel of God because the Bible has a variety, a lot of stuff to say about you, your possessions, your finances, work, all these various things. And so if we're going to be a full gospel church, if we're going to be a church that teaches or attempts to teach the whole counsel of God, we've got to include finances because they are such a, a major part of all of our lives. Amen. Amen. And so we've got to see, and I think that most Christians really do want to know, what does God's Word have to say about our financial lives? And so that is what our attempt is going to be in the next couple or three weeks or whatever it is, uh, to try to find out the best we can in that amount of time, what does God's Word say about our financial life? Would that be all right? Amen. And so I'd like us to start off by turning to Genesis chapter 12, and then we're going to go to Galatians chapter 3, but we're going to start off uh, with Genesis chapter 12. Genesis the 12th chapter, all of you probably know where Genesis is, right? Easy to find, right? Genesis the 12th chapter, remembering again uh, that it's been many years since I uh, even attempted to teach a series on this as far as I can tell and uh, again that tells me that maybe I have uh, dropped the ball a little bit, maybe I should have done better than this and now waited eight years in order to teach a series on God's financial plan, but that's all right. God will make up for it, amen? All right, so in Genesis chapter 12, let's start reading here at verse 1. Everybody, if you're there, say yes. yes. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, and we never want to take anything for granted, and so Abram was the name for Abraham before his name was changed. Most of you probably heard of Abraham. We're going to look at Galatians where his name will be referred to as Abraham, but Abram is the name for Abraham before God changed his name. We won't go into all the reasons why God changed his name right now, uh, but nevertheless, this is referring to the same individual. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you I will make you a great nation I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed now you'll notice that as God speaks to Abram here uh, Abram is, is given a command he is told by God, God he said Abram you need to get out of your country and away from your family and if you'll obey me and go into a place that you you've never been before, if you will just obey me because you have faith in me, he says, I'm going to bless you. And not only am I going to bless you, but I'm going to make you a blessing. And then there's a prophetic word in this where he says in verse, uh, the latter part of verse three, he says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that particular phrase is a prophetic phrase having to do with the fact that it was through the seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ is called the seed in the singular of Abraham in Galatians. 
Galatians in particular, through Him, through Christ there, all families of the earth can be blessed if they receive Him as their Lord. Is that not right? Is everybody with me? All right, now having read that, let's go to Galatians, the third chapter, and let's see some other things pertaining to Abraham and the relationship of Abraham with you and I as a believer because we could ask the question, what does Abram or Abraham have to do with me? What does Abram or Abraham have to do with my life today in the 21st century as a Christian? Abram wasn't a Christian, he was a Hebrew. And so what does Abraham's life and what does this command to, uh, from God have to do with my life today as a believer? Let's Let's find out a few of those things right now. Galatians chapter 3 and beginning with verse 6. Notice what Paul is saying by the Holy Spirit. And we have to begin with verse 6 because there's so many scriptures. It's hard to know where to start sometimes. But in verse 6, it says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know, know that, not o- that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. I'm going to pause there. Who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are the nations other than the nation of Israel. The Gentiles are the other nations. You follow what I'm saying? And so we can say when it refers to Gentiles, it's referring to the non-Jews. And so that would probably include most of us here, that we are amongst the Gentiles or the non-Jews in the natural. And so he's saying this in verse 8 again, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the non-Jews, the Gentiles, how? By faith preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. Same idea, all the families, all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now, there's a number of things that we could point out from this. First of all, you'll notice what Paul is saying. First of all, let, let's take note of who he's writing this epistle to, first and foremost. He's writing this epistle uh, to, a, to a bunch of churches in a province called Galatia. Galatia uh, was not a city like so many of the other uh, uh, writings, so many of the other epistles are written to a a city of the church in a particular city, whether it be the city of Corinth or the city of Philippi or the city of uh, of uh, Thessalonica, etc. No, Galatia was not a city. Galatia was a province with many cities, with churches in different cities. And and so he's writing uh, to a province called Galatia that was for the most part uh, uh, consisting of Gentile people those that were not uh, of Jewish lineage. And so he's writing to Gentile, primarily non-Jewish believers uh, that are in the various churches in this province of Galatia. And you understand province. You know, we have states. Canada has provinces like a state. And so it was like a state with many different uh, cities within it. Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, for example, which are mentioned in the book of uh, Acts. They were cities within the province of Galatia. Does everybody understand? what I'm saying to you. All right, and so as we look at this then, the Apostle Paul, again, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says to these Gentile or non-Jewish in terms of natural lineage uh, believers, he says to them that just as Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. In the context of this epistle... He is saying, you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're of the natural lineage of Judaism or not. The whole issue in Galatians, or much of it anyway, was that are we justified by the law? Do we have to be circumcised? Do we have to uh, keep the law and everything else? And the Apostle Paul is, is shouting basically saying, no, you don't have to keep the Judaic law. You are not under the law anymore. You're under the grace of God. And he's saying to them uh, that it's only those who are of faith who are really the sons of Abraham no matter what our natural lineage is. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And so those of us that have exercised faith in Christ, if we were to go on uh, with some of this, you'll notice as we read on in verse 26, it's not up there, uh, but let's read verse 26 now of Galatians 3. I trust that all of you are following me because some of this is kind of from the hip. I wasn't planning on some of this. Is everybody all right? Galatians, same chapter, chapter 3, beginning with verse 23. He says this, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. In other words, even if we were not Jewish, we still had a law. We had a a, a moral law that is built on the inside of us. 
Innately, we all know that murder is wrong, for example, right? And so even if we're not under the Judaic law or ever were as Jews, we still have a, a moral law on the inside of us. Now, as he goes on with this, he says, but before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, for the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. In other words, the law was given because of sin. The law reveals us uh, to us that we are sinners, Whatever law, moral law, the law of Moses, any and all of these kinds of things, it reveals to us that we are sinners. Is that not right? It's by the law that there's a knowledge of sin. Paul talks about that in Romans, for example, and here to a certain extent in Galatians as well. And so the law was given in order to be our tutor until we came to faith. Does that mean that we no longer keep any law? No. Now it means that the law has been written in our hearts and we are empowered to keep what God desires for us to keep. Amen? And so as it reads on in this, it says in verse 24 of Galatians 3, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you, remember who he's writing to, non-Jewish believers primarily. I'm not saying there weren't any Jewish believers within Galatia. I'm sure there were. But primarily non-Jewish believers. Therefore the law, excuse me, for you are are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, that's not talking about water baptism, that's talking about immersion into Christ by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's talking about a spiritual immersion or baptism into Christ that water baptism represents. And so we've been immersed or baptized into Christ. We have put on Christ. Verse 28, note, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Greek is another terminology for a non-Jew. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying this, that once we are in Christ, our natural ethnic group does not matter anymore. Our, our, uh, our social status doesn't matter anymore. Our economic status doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is that we are now all in Christ and we are one and united in Christ. Amen? Amen. Does everybody hear me now? Yes. And so it doesn't matter. Race doesn't matter. Economic status doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All that matters is now we're part of the family of God and we're all sons of God or daughters of God, if you will, uh, born into His family and it's called being born again, isn't it? And so reading on with this, it says in verse, in verse 29, and here's the clincher. And if you are Christ, that's possessive. In other words, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so he's saying, if you belong to Christ, and he's st stating that for those who have come to faith, those who have become sons of God, we now belong to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, we are Abraham's seed. And because we're Abraham's seed, we are heirs according to the promise. Does everybody hear me here today? All right, well, we read about Abram's promise, the first portion of that promise in Genesis chapter 12. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless you so that you can be a, a blessing. Uh, the word bless has the idea of be, being endued with well-being. It has the idea of uh, uh, prosperous. It's talking about prosperous in every way, not just financially, even though our, our subject right now is financial uh, issues. But uh, how many of you know there's more important prosperity than financial prosperity? Uh, you can have all the financial prosperity in the world and, and be and be in poverty spiritually or in poverty in terms of your marriage or your family relationships and everything else. And if that's the case, then the financial prosperity means nothing and is useless, isn't it? Is everybody alive? All right, and so he's saying, though, if we look at this, if we belong to Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. And if we are his seed, then we're heirs of the promise. The promise, the primary promise, is righteousness by faith. Righteousness means we've been declared innocent. Righteousness is a judicial term having to do with being declared innocent. Why are we declared innocent? Well, we know that we've all been sinners, haven't we? How many of you know we've all broken the law of God? Do you know you've broken the law of God? But thank God, because of the blood of Christ, because of His work of redemption, uh, our slate has been wiped clean, and now we are innocent in God's sight. Christ took our guilt so we could have His innocence, right? The great substitution has taken place, right? 
Amen. And so the, the real blessing in the singular is that of righteousness. But because we're righteous or in right standing or innocent in the sight of God, there are other blessings uh, uh, that are residual as a result of being righteous in Christ. Is everybody following me here today? And so let's just uh, examine in, uh, in regard to this issue, this subject we're talking about. Look at Psalms, if you will. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Well, it's quiet in here. I remember the good old days when I could hear pages flipping. Now a lot of times you're on those little things like my wife is. These little, these little electronic things. People say, Pastor Jay, you're old-fashioned. You know, sometimes I think in our world, little old fashioned is good for us. Amen. Just a thought, just a thought. All right, let, let's look here uh, just for a moment here. I wasn't planning on going here, so I'll have to find it. Uh, but let, let's look on here. It says this. See if I can find it. Everybody with me? All right. Let, let's, let's go on with this. It says, beginning with verse, uh, we'll start with verse 1 of Psalm 34. Paul, David is speaking here by the Spirit of God. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord of me and let us exalt his name together. Then he goes on. He says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Now remember, David is in the covenant of Abraham, isn't he? Right? He's a descendant of Abraham. He's one of the covenant uh, uh, partakers, if you will. And, and he understood some things about this. As we go on, go down to verse 8 to save time. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusted him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions uh, lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. He goes on and he mentions a lot of things. And, and notice now it says in verse 17, it says, the righteous cry out. Everybody say, the righteous cry out. Out. Who are the righteous under the new covenant? Those uh, that are sons of God are declared righteous by faith, aren't we? Another scripture you might want to write down is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 21 makes it very clear. It says, he who knew no sin, who's that speaking of Christ, was made to be sin for us. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To be declared innocent in his sight. He took our unrighteousness so that we could have his righteousness. And it goes on and it says, The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The righteous might be afflicted, but the Lord is the deliverer. The Lord is the deliverer of whatever kind of affliction we might have, including the affliction of poverty. Poverty is an affliction. Poverty is something where we are lacking. Notice as it reads on with this, it goes on and it says in verse 20, he guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. And so my, my thought is this, that for the righteous there are what? Residual blessings of deliverance and taking care of them and, and providing for them and even health. I mean there's a lot of things in Psalm 103 for example. Uh, the scripture says, bless the Lord, O my soul, beginning with verse 1 of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Who redeems my life from destruction, who forgives my sin, who heals me. All these variety of things. Why? Because we're righteous. These are all residual blessings of having been blessed and becoming righteous through Christ by faith. Amen? And so again, to be blessed with believing Abraham then is to receive what? Is to receive righteousness, innocence, right standing with God, but then along with that everything else, which I would submit to you includes uh, God's financial blessings in our lives. Now, when I say that, I am not saying that God has ordained that we all be millionaires. I'm not even saying uh, that God has ordained that we all be rich. Uh, but of course, rich is a little bit subjective. You know, you can be, you know, most Americans are richer than a lot, than a lot of folks in other lands. Even people that are on uh, welfare in many respects are richer than a lot of folks that are in other countries. Are you, are you following what I'm saying to you? And so rich is a little subjective. It's all a matter of perspective. But what I'm saying is, uh, unlike a lot of things we hear today in the world, in, in Christianity, if you will, 
God has not necessarily ordained us all to be wealthy because much of what he has to say in the scripture are warnings about money more than the blessings that he has provided. Money can be a danger to us as well. And that's why God warns us so many times about finances. Now, uh, let's move on from here. Are you getting anything out of this so far? Why people react negatively to this subject in church? Because we know that they do. That's one reason why it's been about eight years uh, since I taught on this as a series, is because people react negatively. But remember what I said as we open this up. I said to you uh, that if we're going to be a full gospel church, that means we need to talk about the whole counsel of God, and, and finances and material possessions are a major part of what the gospels and even the scripture as a whole uh, talks about. Now, why, though, do people react negatively? They are ignorant of the scriptures on this subject many times, and so they react negatively. And, you know, I'll just add this thought. I'm amazed at some of the preachers that preach against uh, what is called, and I understand there's extremes, uh, but, you know, I read a lot of things online and whatever, and there's this derogatory terminology, usually when they use it, a prosperity gospel. Now, I know what they mean by that, but I never really thought of anything as the prosperity gospel. How many of you know there's only one gospel? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? But what they're doing is they're using that in a, in a, in a derogatory way, suggesting that all the preachers uh, that talk about prosperity, and I would grant you, there are some of them, that's practically all they talk about is prosperity, and that is out of, uh, that is out of balance, isn't it? I understand what I'm saying. And so what does that do? Doesn't that sound just like something the devil would do? The devil is our adversary. He walks about uh, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 or so. And so we know he is our adversary. And doesn't it sound just like the devil to make a subject like finances to go into an extreme so that many people, whether they be believers or unbelievers, throw the whole thing out and come up with a derogatory term like prosperity gospel so that that might hinder believers from giving to legitimate gospel ministries because they're thinking, well, they're just asking for money all the time. Doesn't that sound like something the, the adversary would build in the minds of God's people? And what has that done? That's crippled the body of Christ. That's crippled the church in so many ways. Where last time I knew, only about 9% of what claim to be evangelical Christians, which are Christians that are born again by the Spirit of God, only about 9% give a tithe to their local church. How many of you know that is an indication, that is a symptom of a sick church? It's just a fact. Is everybody all right? See, already, I think sometimes, well, you know, he's just wanting more money. I'm not talking about more money. I'm talking about Bible here, and we're trying to teach the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so, many times, people are negatively uh, on this subject or have negativity toward this subject because they're ignorant of what the Scriptures on this subject, or they have heard teaching that was out of balance on this subject, as I already said, and certainly there is. There's a lot. Of, I, I'll flip through stations once in a while. I don't very often, but I'll flip through stations once in a while, and, and uh, a few particular preachers, that is like their main subject all the time. Something's wrong with that. Something's wrong with that. And then also, they've seen TV evangelists who appeared less than honest. And maybe were, all right? I don't know. And maybe they've heard reports and, and things like this. But I will say this to you. Don't believe everything you read on the Internet. You know, we used to joke about, well, it was in the newspaper. It must be true. Well, we found out, you know, real fast that just because it's in the newspaper doesn't mean it's true either. And certainly just because something's on the Internet about anybody doesn't mean that what they're saying is true. You understand that, right? You need to check things out. And even, you know, I've taken a lot of courses online and, and gotten a couple of degrees online and what have you. And, and one thing that they have warned us about repeatedly is, you know, you better check your sources. Don't just take any old source. There are certain things that you can do in order to check those sources to make sure that they are valid sources sources, so that you're not quoting uh, something that is, uh, you know, not accurate because you want to be accurate. For example, how many of you know that Wikipedia is nothing you can really go by? Did you know that? If you ever gone on Wikipedia, you ever notice that there's this little thing there that says edit? That means anybody can come on there and edit the information. You realize that, right? And so, you know, I could go on there. I could edit the information. What's that? They have qualifications. All right, I couldn't. 
All right. But a lot of people do go on there that, uh, you know, bypass the system. And, and it is understood by any scholars, for example, that you can't go and get information from Wikipedia and expect it to necessarily be true. You follow that, all right? And so you have to check your sources, check your resources, and all of those variety of things. All right. And so they've seen TV evangelists who appeared less than hours. They have been raised with traditions that teach the opposite. And, and you know, a lot of folks have uh, been taught in churches or, or maybe outside of church uh, that poverty is more spiritual spiritual. And so uh, they have the idea that if you're poor, uh, you are uh, more spiritual and all of that kind of thing. But I, I do want to say to you that there's no scripture for that. And, and you know, people talk about a, a vow of poverty. There's no scripture for that. God is not, he is not concerned about you and I having possessions, but he is concerned about possessions having us. You understand that, right? And so he's not concerned about us having possessions. Uh, in fact, we'll look at some scripture in a little while that shows that he has given us richly all things to enjoy. But he is concerned, if you will, let me use that terminology for God. I don't know if God's, he's not concerned about anything. But you understand what I'm saying. He doesn't want possessions having us. And that's why there's so many warnings about that. Going on with this, I trust that you're getting something out of this today. I, I'm working hard. I'm plowing the field here, all right? They actually believe many times, why is there negativity in this subject in the church? They actually believe that Christians should not have much money, which goes along uh, with what we just said. And then they're bound by fear and mistrust of pastors and preachers. Some of these are related. They, like the Pharisees of old, have a religious and a critical attitude. I want you to know something, that if you look at things, anything with a critical eye, you're going to find something to be critical about. Right? I mean, you, you can, some of you are listening to me right now and you're being critical of something probably. And there's a lot to be critical about. Amen? I mean, I don't know what it might be. I mean, because I'm perfect. Uh, but, another, <laughs> but, uh, but there's plenty to be critical about, about anything. You, if you look with a critical eye, you'll find it. Right? I mean, I even was critical of myself today. I saw these ushers coming in here, and they were all spiffy with suits and ties. And I thought to myself, man, I look like a slouch. I mean, or whatever, I, you know. The ushers, they look better than I do because they're all dressed up or whatever. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, I don't like ties. I wear them once in a while. <laughs> One thing about ties, you know, they choke me and I lose my voice. And all of you want to hear what I have to say, right? <laughs> Another reason why is they feel convicted. Many times people are negative about this subject in churches because they feel convicted by the Holy Spirit that they're not using their money the way God intends. You know, sometimes people get mad about what is said because of conviction of the Holy Spirit that comes on them, no matter what the subject might be. Isn't that right? I mean, if you talk about sin or whatever uh, area you're talking about, if people get convicted by the Holy Spirit, sometimes the reaction is not joy. It's not gratitude that God's bringing correction through His Word. Uh, sometimes it's conviction by the Holy Spirit, and, and, and it makes them mad instead. Right? But notice some of these statistics, just so we understand some things. 15% or so, and I've gotten this from more than one source to help verify this, 15% of everything Jesus said related to money and possessions that's recorded in the Gospels. 15% is pretty significant when you think about it. Jesus made more references to money and possessions than he did to heaven and hell. In fact, I don't have this as one of my things on my list, but it's a fact that almost half of the parables that Jesus gave or taught, almost half of the parables had to do with possessions or money, and most of the time it had to do with warning people about the wrong attitude and use of money and possessions. He used a lot of examples that we'll talk about in a few minutes as well. Jesus taught that there's a fundamental connection between a person's spiritual life and his attitudes and actions concerning money and possessions. If you don't mind going real quickly to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. He talked about money so much uh, that probably, you know, people could have thought about him if he was here as the pastor of Abounding Grace from the average church. Uh, people get upset and say, Jesus, all he's after is my money. But notice here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, beginning with verse 16. Are you there? If you're there, say yes. yes. Verse 60. It says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, 
What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Verse 17. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is, but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, This young man, by the way, I think is gutsy, man. After Jesus said these things to him, this young man said to him, what's he say? All these things I've kept from my youth. I've done it all right, Jesus. I've done all these things right. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard what that saying, he went away, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was testing this young man and really helping this young man. Not that Jesus didn't necessarily already know, but he was helping this young man to realize some things. That if you really loved your neighbor as yourself, you wouldn't be so self-possessed with possessions. In other words, Jesus wasn't even concerned so much with him selling everything that he had. He was testing this young man so that this man would come to the realization, you know what, you have all these possessions and the reality of it is all these possessions really have you. Are you following what I'm saying? You know, later on, Jesus said, no man has left houses and, and uh, land and, and uh, all these other possessions that has not received them back again a hundredfold in this life. In other words, he said uh, that when you, when you give away, God is going to help you get back again, but he wants to test your heart to make sure again uh, that your heart is in the right place, right? And so therefore I say uh, in this particular point, Jesus taught that there's a fundamental connection between a person's spiritual life and his attitudes and actions concerning money and possessions. In fact, I would dare say to you today that money is probably the greatest competitor of God in most people's lives. Are you hearing me? Let's go on with this. All right. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, you'll know the scripture. Most of you know it. Jesus said this, still going along with our spiritual, our, our heart, really, if you will. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Notice what he said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I know that this is a very common passage of scripture, uh, but let's just think about this just for a moment. He is talking about laying up treasures in heaven, and the first thought that would come to our minds, at least the way my mind thinks, is how do you lay up treasures in heaven? How do you do that? Well, if we're to take the whole of scripture, I would submit to you the primary way we lay up treasures in heaven is by seeking first the kingdom of God, a, a contributing to the kingdom of God in our actions, in our work, uh, in our ministry, in our finances. The more we contribute to the kingdom of God, the more we are laying up treasures in heaven. And what he's saying, the main point that he's trying to emphasize is he wants your treasures uh, to be invested in heaven because if your treasures are invested in heaven, then your heart will be in heaven things and your heart will be right before God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's where you invest that your heart is. And so he's saying invest in heaven. Invest in the kingdom. Invest in the things of God. Because where you invest, where you're investing is where your heart uh, will be. And so based on this, we would understand that, that God is not after your stuff. He's after your hearts. And yet our heart is an indication about where we are at ter in terms of our stuff. Isn't that right? In fact, I wrote this down as well. There is nothing that reveals our heart like the issue of money. In fact, there's probably very few things that get people more upset than the issue of money. There's probably very few things that cause more uh, couples to be in arguments. Husbands and wives probably argue more. In fact, I read this somewhere. They argue more about money, usually the lack of, more about money than any other subject. Is everybody with me here? And so again, our money does in many ways uh, uh, cause us to reveal what's really in our heart. Our attitude toward money, our attitude toward giving, our attitude uh, toward a variety of things. This has a lot to do with our, 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 our heart and a measurement of where our heart is at. And so I would say, based on that so far, we could easily say that this subject of God's financial plan is extremely important to God. Because where our treasure is, there our heart is also, right? Right? 
Amen. All right, let's just go on a little bit and just see a few more things. Notice this. When Jesus, notice how Jesus used possessions and money, some examples, in, in order to teach lessons here. When Jesus wanted to talk about accountability, how many of you know accountability is important? Five of you do believe that. That's good. When, when, when G, the rest of you are just not accountable. All right, so when Jesus wanted to talk about accountability, he talked about a traveling nobleman who left money with his servants and held them accountable as to how they used it. And so again, he left them possessions, he left them money, he left them talents, if you will, a form of money, a measurement of money, and, and, and gave them instructions as to how to use it, and they were, they were uh, left accountable for how they used the money. And so to teach accountability, he used an illustration of money in order to teach that also. When Jesus wanted to talk about the value of the kingdom, he talked about a merchant man who sold everything he had in order to buy the pearl of great price. And sometimes, you know, in, in the old days, you know, and maybe you've heard this, maybe you still believe this, some people have thought, well, the pearl of great price is Jesus. I want you to know that Jesus is not the pearl of great price. Talked about it in that parable. Now, don't go away from here. Oh, Pastor Jay, you know, he's teaching wrong stuff. The pearl of great price. How many of you know what was purchased by God? You and me. Redemption, right? Jesus paid the price, didn't he? Jesus is the purchaser. He purchased you and me. He's the merchant man. He, he gave it all away so that we, the pearl of great price in God's sight, might be purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so even with that illustration, again, he uses the idea of, of money in order to illustrate redemption. We've been redeemed. We've been bought back. We've been purchased by the blood, haven't we? The blood is the currency of heaven in order to bring about yours and my redemption. And so going on uh, with a few of these things, notice now, when Jesus wanted to talk about the importance of living for others instead of oneself, he spoke of a rich man who kept building bigger and better barns until he finally died and found he had wasted his life and treasure serving himself instead of others. And so the wrong use, the misuse, the abuse of money, of possessions, it, because he just wanted to splurge it on himself. You can read the accounts, we don't have time. When Jesus wanted to talk about forgiveness... He talked about a rich man and an unjust steward and forgiving money debts. You remember it in Matthew chapter 18. He gave the illustration of a man who came to his master and he owed the master lots of money. And he asked for forgiveness and the master said, all right, I forgive you of your debt. And that same servant went to a fellow servant who owed him a minuscule amount of money and he threw him into prison because that servant couldn't pay him the minuscule amount of money. And again, the lesson is about forgiveness, isn't it? And so even to teach about forgiveness, Jesus used money in order to help us understand. All right, now notice, if God has not been given control of your finances and possessions, the truth is he does not have your entire life. I'll just read that again. If God has not been given control of your finances and possessions, the truth is he does not have your entire life. The vast majority of our lives revolves around the making of money, the spending of money, and the management of money. How many of you probably would agree with that, right? Yeah. Amen. I mean, you spent money to get here today. You spent gasoline money, didn't you? You spent money in order to eat breakfast this morning. I mean, all the life revolves around these kinds of things, don't they? We're spending money even as we sit here because we're using electricity. And we're, we're, we're using all sorts of, we're using heat, we're using gas, natural gas, in order to heat this particular room and what have you. And so we're spending money, even to be here today and to be able to be comfortable in order to receive the Word of God, aren't we? If Jesus Christ is yours and my Lord, should He not have a say in the issue of money and possessions which take up an incredible part of our lives? And the answer, I think, is safe to say without any question, the answer is yes. Amen? And so the point is this, that God is interested in our possessions. He's interested in what we have. I'd like to close by going, if you don't mind, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. How many of you are mad or glad? I hope so. Just trying to teach the whole scripture. I mean, you know, I feel like I've been negligent. If it's been eight years, if my, if my records serve me right, if it's been eight years since I teach, taught any series on this, I've been negligent about this because it is a major part. Jesus talked about it a whole bunch more. Now notice as we look here in verse, we'll start with verse 3 of 1 Timothy 6. Are you there? 
It says this, verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise, and, and you know, he mentions a bunch of things prior. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose, notice this last phrase, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. And so this idea, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. You know, some people have this idea, that, and it relates to this particular phrase. It's worded different in the King James Bible, where it says something to the effect that suppose that, that godliness is great gain, with the idea, perhaps, it seems, that people measure your spirituality by how much stuff you have. And I would say to you that those who are in extreme concerning the so-called prosperity gospel, that's exactly the kind of information of the exact message that many times they bring across, that the more stuff you have is an indication that you're more spiritual because you got more faith to believe God for more stuff. How many of you know that is not biblical? Yours and my spirituality is not measured by how much stuff we have. I'll be honest with you, if that were the case, man, most of you never saw our house. Uh, we do not have an extravagant house. We have an old house. We have a house that's a fixer-upper house, and we've owned it for 20 years, and it's still a fixer-upper house. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You got one. Hey, man. Amen. And, and, you know, the whole thing is this, that spirituality is not measured by how much we have. And so no matter what preacher um, gives that message, and really they don't necessarily really come out with that, but it's certainly implied sometimes. And we need to be watchful of that. And, and I, I want to add this too. Don't be overcritical of people that might say some things wrong. I'll say some things wrong. And if you're looking at a critical eye and hearing, you know, you'll hear something that I might say wrong. All right? And if you want to correct me, correct me. And if it's scriptural, I'll correct myself. I'll correct myself. How many of you know I shared this Thursday night, and then I'll get back to where I was? All right? I'm taking a little rabbit trail. How many of you know rabbit trails are good things sometimes, right? But, you know, I said to, this, I said to the folks here Thursday night, you know, Apollos was a great man, a preacher of the gospel. You can read about him in Acts chapter 18 in many respects. And he was a great man. He spoke the word of God. He was full of the word of God. He was a man of the scriptures and he spoke eloquently. And he won a lot of people to Christ. But then there was a couple, a husband and wife team called Aquila and Priscilla. Priscilla is the woman. Aquila is the man. They had met. They had, they had uh, poetic names together, Aquila and Priscilla. And they took Apollos to the side. They took him off to the side and they encouraged Apollos, who again was an elo uh, eloquent speaker and he was mighty in the scriptures, the Bible says, and he was accurate. But then they went and took him to the side and showed him some things so that he would teach the word of God more accurately. He was accurate, but they taught him, and he was receptive, a humble man as well as an eloquent speaker. He was receptive, and even though he was accurate in what he preached, they taught him some things so that he would be more accurate. How many of you know that's the journey of every preacher, hopefully? Amen? And every Christian, that we're accurate, but as we grow and we're humble, we receive instruction and, and, and correction, we'll go from accurate to more accurate, and we'll all grow, and we'll all serve God together. Amen? Amen. And so, again, you'll hear preachers say things that might be off or extreme or whatever else, but that doesn't mean they don't have something that's good, good to say as well, right? But, you know, sometimes they'll have the idea and they'll imply that the more stuff you have, the more spiritual you are. But spirituality is measured by one thing and one thing only, and that is the fruit of the Spirit. It's measured by the love walk primarily because that is the fruit, isn't it? Galatians chapter 5. Uh, spirituality is measured by love. It's measured by our walk of love, supernatural love, God's kind of love. Spirituality is not measured by the gifts of the Spirit like prophecy or speaking in tongues. That's not a measurement of spirituality. Spirituality is measured by one thing and one thing alone, and that is our love walk and loving one another with God's love uh, that has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so as we read on in this, and I'm getting ready to close. I'm on my second closing now. Everybody all right? I think it was in Philippians, Paul said, finally, my brethren, two times. I'm on my second finally, my brethren. All right? And as we go on with this, notice it says in verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world. We're back in 1 Timothy chapter 6. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men, men in destruction and perdition. What's that? That's a warning about those whose goal in life is to be rich. 
and presumably for their own benefit and to splurge upon themselves in a selfish way. Then go on, verse 10, and this is misquoted so many times it's unbelievable. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and, per- and pierced themselves through with many sorrow. See, on television, you know, in movies, they'll say, well, money's the root of all evil. How many of you know it doesn't say that? It says the love of money is the root of all evil, and it connects it with these men who desire to be rich and end up piercing themselves. Why? Because their motive, their intent, their mindset is a love for money. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't love money and love God at the same time. In fact, when we give of our tithes and offerings, when our heart is right, that giving of our tithes and offerings is part of what helps keep us free from the love of money because we're giving it freely and out of love for God and it helps us stay free uh, from this wrong attitude and mindset called the love of money. If you were to sum up every sin in the world today, it'll come back to the love of money. Abortion, murdering children, it's all about a love for money. Pornography, it's all about a love for money. You name it, it's all back to a love for money, isn't it? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But yet as we go on with this, it says, But you, O man of God, verse 11, flee these things. And purpose and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. He goes on and mentions some things, but I've got to end this. Now notice as Paul goes on though in verse 17. Verse 17. Paul speaking to Timothy, who was the pastor of the church in Ephesus at this time. He speaks to Timothy, and what does he say? He says to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age. In other words, Timmy, Timothy, Timmy, <laughs> Timothy, Timothy had rich people in his church. And what's he say? What's Paul say? Does he say, command those who are rich in your church to give away all their money? He doesn't say that. He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Here's where we uh, get into trouble. Because a love for money means a trust in riches. And how many of you know, riches are are, are very fickle, aren't they? Just watch the stock market. So he says, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, or to trust in the living God. Notice the last phrase, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So what is he saying? He's not saying having things is wrong. He's not saying that, uh, that we shouldn't be blessed. He's actually saying that God has given us all things richly to enjoy. In other words, it's his will. He has no problem with us having things to enjoy, but he is saying, that we don't want to have a love for the money and we don't want to trust in uncertain riches. We want to love God and trust in God. Amen? Amen. And let God uh, take care of the rest. And so this is the beginning of our financial plan that God has for us. Uh, Finances, money, possessions are a tool for the kingdom of God. Uh, They are a tool. They are nothing more. They cannot be our God. They cannot be our idol uh, that we worship. And we need to put our love in God. Give in love. No matter where we give. Give of ourselves. Give of our finances. Whatever we give, we give out of love for God, for His glory and His purposes to be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. That's part one. Would you stand with me and if the worship team would come, let's pray. Amen.